Let's ultrasound. On today's edition of Small Parts Ultrasound, we're diving in to an ultrasound of the submandibular gland. Now let's look at the typical appearance of the submandibular gland on ultrasound. The drawing on the left represents a transverse submandibular gland. You'll note that it's slightly lobulated, hypervascular, and you commonly can see little pieces of blood vessels within the middle of the gland. The mylohyloid muscle is going to be inferior to the gland, with the hyperechoic tongue below that. The image to the right is an oblique representation of the submandibular mandibular glands. And this is the plane that you want to get in order to try to visualize the Wharton's duct, which would be located below the mylohyloid muscle and anterior to the tongue on ultrasounds. It's exceedingly challenging to visualize Wharton's duct unless it is dilated and abnormal, so do not get discouraged if you cannot find this unless pathology is present within the duct. The intraparenchymal submandibular duct would run through the middle when it is visualized. The submandibular glands can also be imaged separately by themselves on an ultrasound or as part of a standard thyroid ultrasound protocol. When they're imaged separately, you want to take a picture of the transverse right or left submandibular gland with and without width and AP measurements. Note that width is going to be a horizontal measurement and the AP measurement is going to be a vertical measurement on an ultrasound. You also want a transverse right and left submandibular gland image images with color Doppler. Next, move to the sagittal plane, a sagittal right and left submandibular gland with and without length measurements. Note that length is a horizontal measurement on the ultrasound. And then sagittal right and left submandibular glands with color Doppler. And you want to document any masses, stones, or other pathology that's visualized. To document the submandibular gland as part of a normal thyroid protocol, you want to use the dual screen control on an ultrasound to document both the right and the left transverse submandibular glands. The right-sided dual screen image can be used to document the transverse right submandibular gland, and the left-sided dual screen image can be used to document the transverse left submandibular gland. Note that this corresponds to the right and the left of the patient's body rather than the right and left sides of the ultrasound monitor. Now let's look at some ultrasound images of the submandibular gland. For the transverse submandibular gland, you want to document without and with width and AP measurements. These are a horizontal and a vertical measurement on the ultrasound. The gland is going to appear hyperechoic with a homogeneous signal and will be brighter on ultrasounds and more hyperechoic depending on how much fat is within the gland. And you can commonly visualize small anechoic blood vessels within the center of the gland. You want to also document any pathology that's visualized with and without measurements and color documents in two transducer planes. The sagittal right and left submandibular gland should be documented with and without a length measurement, which is a horizontal measurement on the ultrasound. You want to document any pathology. Anterior to the gland on ultrasound will be the subcutaneous fat, and striated muscles will be located laterally and inferior to the gland. And the tongue also may or may not be visualized inferiorly to the submandibular gland. The gland should be hyperechoic in color, but will be brighter white with more attenuation of the sound waves, the fattier the gland appears on ultrasounds. Transverse and sagittal right and left submandibular color Doppler images should be taken. To optimize the color Doppler signal, you want to optimize the box size and position, decrease the color frequency, optimize the PRF and the color Doppler gain, and or turn on slow flow to improve visualization of color Doppler within the color Doppler box. Small arteries and veins can often be visualized within the middle portion of the glass 
glands. And the goal with color Doppler is to look for hypervascularity within the glands or any flow within any visualized masses. And the color Doppler signal is going to be increased with infection and inflammation, cancerous masses, and several other submandibular gland pathologies, such as Sjogren's syndrome. To document the submandibular glands as part of a thyroid ultrasound protocol, you want to use the dual screen ultrasound control so that both the right and the left submandibular glands can be imaged within the same image. In the right dual screen image, you want to image the transverse right submandibular glands. And in the left dual screen image, you want to image the transverse left submandibular gland. And you can place these images at the end of the thyroid protocol along with the other thyroid images. And typically when this is done, the parotid gland is also imaged using dual screen. Note that this represents the right and the left side of the patient's body rather than the right and the left sides of the ultrasound monitor. To locate the submandibular glands on ultrasound, place the transducer below the chin in a transverse plane. From this view, you can view the chin or the mandible in the middle of the image as the dark hypoechoic area, and on the lateral sides of the mandible will be the transverse right and left submandibular glands, and these are going to be hyperechoic and homogenous on the ultrasound image. To view each gland separately, slide laterally in a transverse plane from the chin bone and the gland will be visualized.